Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Suzanne Miller, and I'm a principal researcher in the SEI Software Solutions Division. Today, I am joined by Dr. Sam Proctor and Lutz Vraga, two of our researchers also in the SEI Software Solutions Division. Today, we are here to talk about their work on a model-based tool to assist in and most excitedly, partially automate the design of safety critical systems. Welcome to you both. Thanks. Thank you. So let's start by telling our audience about you, what brought you to the SEI and the work that you do here, especially since I know, Lutz, this is your first one. Um, Lutz, why don't you start us? Um, yeah. Um... What do I do at DSCI? So, I mean, I mostly um, work with um, with model-based engineering and uh, analyzing architectures, software architectures, uh, system architectures. So, um, yeah, my interest in that started when I, well, shortly after I came to the SEI. So that was, uh, it was almost 20 years ago. And um, I found myself working um, in an office next to uh, the office of Peter Feiler, who ah. um, I, uh, uh, well, of course, I, I, I talked to him and it turned out that he was the technical editor of the ADL standard and one of the driving forces behind it. And ADL is a language to um, describe um, software and system architectures for embedded and real-time systems. And um, yeah, I got interested. And so together we started uh, developing an open source tool called Osate to mm -hmm. build and analyze ADL models. Um, and one of the great features of ADL um, is that it was developed with a focus um, on uh, creating models that you can actually analyze. So you can right. um, not just build a model and um, create a nice diagram, put it on a PowerPoint and show it and talk about it. I mean, this is nice for architectures, but um, this one in ADL, it's a bit more formal. So you can, uh, so you have certain components, cannot just um, do, it's not just boxes and lines. So it's certain components that have certain semantics. Um, it, you can attach properties to them and then you can actually analyze them and um, can write um, automated analysis. And so that's um, that has been a big time, a part of my work over the years to develop these analysis, improve Osate. Um, so for the last couple of years, I have led all the development activities around Osate and um, with a goal of, of course, making it easier to use, mm -hmm. having a broader audience uh, Look at it. Um, it is, um, I would say, fairly stable now, and um, it's not that not not easy to crash it. So it works. It works. Pretty, it works pretty well. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lutz. Sam, why don't you give us a little bit about yourself and what brought you here and what you're doing here? Sure, sure. So um, I've always been fascinated by the way. Um, software and software tooling can support and reinforce process improvements. Uh, I had a friend in college who worked on an improvement to Excel that would like highlight a little uh, corner of a cell uh, if it was different, if the formula in the cell was different than the formulas around it. And I thought that was fascinating, this idea of a really gentle nudge from a well-designed program that could correct or, or prevent an error with like very minimal user involvement. The user doesn't have to understand anything deeply. They just get a notification that, hey, maybe maybe there's something that you need to look into here. Mm -hmm. and, and I like this idea of things getting better and visibly over time. Uh, I've always been interested in computers. And so the, the blend of those two is software engineering, the way to, to build software better. So that's what I studied in graduate school. And while there, uh, I was exposed to a lot of pretty formal model-based engineering including uh, that modeling language that Lutz mentioned, uh, the architecture analysis and design language, or AADL. So AADL was developed uh, by the SEI, and I came here uh, after graduation to continue the work that I started as a student. And now here at the SEI, I, I wear a couple of hats. Uh, one is I'm the lead of the model-based engineering group. Um, I look at how to apply model-based technology to solve DOD and industry challenges, particularly those with safety and security critical uh, systems. 
And then the other hat that I wear is, is of a researcher, uh, an architecture, a system architecture researcher. Um, mostly I'm still doing this sort of hands-on research uh, that drew me to the field in the first place. Um, and it uh, most of my work is on safety, but some projects like this one uh, are a little bit further afield and a little bit more experimental. Uh, and that really uh, keeps it interesting and, and keeps it exciting. So uh, Lutz knows, I think, I don't know if you know, Sam, I've, I've been following AADL pretty much since its inception as a language. And it, and it is, it has some unique aspects that analyzability um, of, and ability to ingest from multiple other modeling uh, uh, approaches is one of the things that is really, really useful in AADL. And now you guys are taking it even farther. But before we get into what you've done, let's talk about the current state of the art in designing safety critical systems, because I think it's important that people understand what are the challenges and pressure points for system and software architects that are de designing these very complex real-time systems. Sure, yeah, yeah. So there are several challenges, but uh, they largely stem from increasing system complexity. So of course that complexity isn't all bad. Modern systems are pretty undeniably more capable than their predecessors, but that capability comes as a result of more powerful hardware, uh, more sophisticated mm -hmm. software, more sensitive and, and, and just more sort of types of sensors, things like that. Not only does this make building these systems more complex, but it also makes them harder to certify as well, because of course, most safety critical systems have to be certified for their use before being deployed. You can't just compile and, and ship code the way you might for a phone app if you're building something like a medical device. So several techniques have been developed to manage this complexity. And a couple notable ones are model-based systems engineering and uh, design space exploration. So model-based systems engineering, which you'll sometimes hear referred to by its acronym uh, MBSE, is a way in which designers can build simple models of their system and then analyze those models to learn something about the system before building the whole airplane, medical device, what have you. You can think of this like building those little architectural models of a building that you sometimes see on display uh, when there's new development proposed or kept and then put um, in a museum or something. You can learn about what the full building looks like. You can show it to people and, and say, you know, do you like the columns on this building? Do you want this wing over here painted a different color? And you can do all of that uh, much more quickly and much more cheaply than actually building the building. And then once it's completely ready to go, asking people if they like it or not. So model-based systems engineering is, is similar. We build small models of systems, we analyze them, and then if we like it, we build the real system. If we don't, we tweak the model and move on. Uh, design space exploration is uh, a different way of tackling complexity. But the idea here is, is that we input a bunch of information about um, the components that we can use to build a system or that we might use or that we might build and then build our system from these components. And then tell the computer what we're looking for and let the computer search through potentially millions or billions of combinations of these components to see what might be a good fit. So if we return to our load bearing or our building example, um, we might input things like the price and uh, weight bearing information of various types of structural components uh, that we could use to build the walls uh, of the building. And then we could tell the computer, you know, find us the cheapest option or find us the strongest option or find us the cheapest option that will guarantee some minimum amount of strength. And computers are really good at plugging all of these elements together, uh, seeing what satisfies the user's criteria and, and what doesn't, and then presenting those options to the system designer who can uh, make better informed choices as a result of all this searching. Right. And so, I mean, for some people, uh, the thing that I immediately thought of when I read in the blog post about design by shopping is, is you know, Amazon and all the really powerful search engines that I, I want a blue one of these, or I want a red one of these, or I want one of these that does this and this and this. And so this is really applying a lot of that same sophistication in algorithms that are now available to do this and other language extensions and, and things that you've done under the covers to allow us to apply this to that very challenging space where we don't, you know, the constraints it's not like shopping at Amazon, right? You've got a right. lot more constraints that you've got to fit into to get your design to work. 
And so let's talk about that. Um, and this has been detailed in a recent paper and blog post. Those will be available to everyone in our transcript. But you've prototyped a language extension for AADL, and then you've brought in a different, um, a different set of tools to work within Osate, Lutz. Um, and now we've got Guided Architecture Trade Space Explorer, uh, otherwise known as GATSI. So it partially automates MBSE so that our engineers can rapidly explore different design options within often very constrained design spaces. So tell me all about it because I'm very excited about this. Yeah, um, so let me first a bit, uh, talk a bit about, about the tool in ADL in, in, in a bit more detail so to, to set the, the context a bit. Um, so we have this, this Osata tool to work with uh, the ADL models. And um, so that, that that tool itself is is based on Eclipse. So that's actually something that software developers will likely be familiar with, gives you the regular IDE experience. Um, of course, we don't do a, a programming language, but we uh, use it to cre uh, edit ADL code. And um, so ADL is a bit different um, than, than other modeling formalisms in that it supports both uh, textual uh, syntax in that regard, it's a bit similar to a programming language. And also you can um, uh, use a diagram editor to create um, ADL models. So that's a bit like more like a UML diagrams or SysML or, or whatnot. So then um, yeah, ADL, as we mentioned before, uh, um, is, is uh, good at um, having all the information to automatically analyze um, models and it has its roots well originally it was actually called not architecture analysis and design language but i think avionics architecture design language so it, its roots are in in avionics systems but um well we expanded that out into general uh, modeling of embedded and real-time systems because well there is uh, there are many things in avionics system are just apl applicable ac across the board and um so this language comes with built-in notions of processors and threads and that have properties um, that um, support analysis of, of uh, schedulability, for example, like how often does something execute, how long does it take, and things like that. Um, so in general, we have modeling of, of the runtime architecture of a software system, so the, the threads and the, the communication between threads, then the execution platform, processors and buses that connect them and devices. Um, we put in information about the deployment, so which software executes on which processor. And we use device components to model various real world components that we treat as black box, can treat as black boxes and just model their properties. So sensors, actuators, maybe also mechanical components. Um, so in, in our paper, we use an example, a wheel braking system for an airplane. Um, of course, there you have mechanical components and hydraulics and, and a computer system um, to go with it. So um, yeah, that's, that's the part about um, ADL. Um, now I, um, Sam can talk a bit about the, the other pieces that we have, the, the um, 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 what does it stand for? A R L the yeah oh, the A T A A T S tool yeah yeah yeah. So we started with A D L. We had this really strong uh, model based uh, background basis tool that we wanted to build on, and we wanted to explore the combination of M B S E with design space exploration. So looking at tools that support design space exploration, we found a tool developed uh, at Penn State called uh, the A R L Trade Space Visualizer or A T S V. Uh, which is software that supports the exploration of what they call a trade space, but is equivalent to what we have been calling the design space, which is the, the full set of possible systems that could be built out of components that either already exist or might be custom created as part of the project. So ATSV was really intended for more, more physical systems, things like airplane wings. Um, they have a study where they build a satellite antenna with it rather than the software-based critical systems that we use uh, AADL and OSATE on. It's also designed uh, to take in like a big spreadsheet of all your components and then sort of compute things based on that. 
but it had the ability to connect to uh, external programs that would describe the set of components and their categories and all their information. And so what we did was uh, one of our first tasks was to connect ATSV to OSATE through this programmatic interface so that they could, <clears throat> they could speak the same language. What we wanted to do and what we ended up building the system to do is to, to make it so that ATSV could select a number of configuration options for a system. Say, we have this AADL model with a bunch of holes in it. We call it a skeleton model. Uh, and the skeleton model, we're going to fill in with these pieces. We're going to use this component um, for in our wheel braking system for the tire. We're going to use that component for the hydraulics, et cetera, et cetera. So ATSV selects all these configuration options. Osate then takes these choices, assembles the model. It starts with the skeleton and fills in the, the, the choices from ATSV. It builds that model, what we call instantiating the model in OSATE, uh, and then runs whatever analysis uh, or analyses the user has, has said that they care about. Um, these might be things like the weight of the built system or its performance according to some uh, metric that the user has specified. Then we'll report, um, OSATE will report all of these results back to ATSV. So it'll say, you know, we built the system or we couldn't build the system, and here's why. Uh, if it could build the system, we ran some analyses on it. Here are the results. Like here's the weight of the system. Here's the price. Here's, you know, in our in our wheel braking system, we had a sort of synthetic analysis called braking power. So it might say like here's the braking power of this particular candidate wheel brake system. So from there, ATSV will uh, use one of a number of algorithms that the user can specify uh, to select a different set of choices. So some of these algorithms. Um, are not very sophisticated. They're just sort of a random walk through uh, the entire design space. But some are very sophisticated and are uh, evolutionary algorithms that can sort of infer the relationships between inputs and outputs and actually really hone in on a particular sweet spot that the user has specified. Like, I want this to be cheap but effective, or I want this to be lightweight um, but uh, very powerful. And so you can you can you can set these these goals in ATSV, and it will use uh, the algorithm that you select to really hone in on that. So uh, identifying, creating, analyzing, and then reporting back on a given model architecture sounds like a lot of work, and it absolutely is. But uh, it takes less than a second on my laptop. So we're talking about a pretty performant um, piece of software, uh, and. We're we're really pretty proud of that. One of the one of the challenges that you might think about as you're hearing all of this capability is how exactly to specify the skeleton model and then the parts of the model that are changeable. And for this, uh, we had to use one of uh, I think researchers' favorite tools, at least in computer science, which is a, a new domain specific language. So Lutz is the main designer of that, and and I guess I'll I'll let you talk about it, uh, Lutz. Yeah. Um... So for this, we, we developed this, this configuration language um, that essentially um, lets you specify which place in, in, the, in the skeleton architecture um, you have that is a hole where something needs to be filled in, and um, also the options that you have to actually fill it in. So, um, so for each of these, um, yeah, these these um, variable elements, we um, define a set of possible candidates that we can stick in there. And um, it also, it's not just that we have uh, candidates; we also have property values that we can specify there, where ATSV can choose among those values and uh, and put them in. Um, so, yeah, this is actually this ended up a bit more powerful than it than the minimum necessary stuff needed uh, for for the the Gatsy project, because um, well we used uh, this also as a as a test bed or as a prototype for some capability that might end up in the next version of the ADL language. Yes, which is a, a language that evolves. It is not a static language. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's currently in the in the, the version two, and we just recently um, made an update to it, version two dot three, and well, um, at some point there may be a version three that then includes a mechanism like we have for this this configuration piece that that we prototype for Gatsy. I am seeing all kinds of applications for this, um, you know, from uh, supply chain management. You know, I've got these five suppliers, and if one of them goes out. 
what is the effect on the model? You know, can I, I can model what the effect is instead of bringing examples of all five components into a lab. Um, if I can specify the, the, the attribute, um, certainly, um, you know, where are the places where we have safety critical, where we have to make a choice? Um, and, 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 you know, no, don't worry so much about the rest, but here's the safety critical pieces or, um, or the security critical piece. I mean, I'm just like ah, all over the place. Um, but how do you envision GATC helping systems engineers, software architects, certifiers of, of I'm, 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 what's your sort of, uh, ideal use case? for people coming in to use Gatsy? Well, I, yeah, I like the way you phrased that question because that, that how, does, how does it help different sort of populations, different sort of users, I think is the really key part because there is a school of thought in design space exploration that's actually just called optimization where you say, you know, here is the goal of the system that I want. Computer, find me the best combination of components and we're gonna build that system. But what people have found is, is that specifying uh, a priori the, the final system's characteristics can be really tricky because you don't necessarily know how all the inputs correlate to the outputs. So the basic idea is that we had for the project is to incorporate model-based systems engineering and this automated design space exploration in a way to generate, evaluate, and then present to a designer a number of candidate architectures. So rather than say, we're gonna find the best architecture, what we say instead is, we're gonna present a number of options to the designer. And from that, uh, the designer is gonna be able to learn things about the, the design space, about sort of the, the world in which they are building their system. So this realizes a paradigm of system design uh, that I think you uh, mentioned earlier called design by shopping. So this, toy, this term was coined by a, a professor at Brigham Young named Richard Balling, uh, who talks about the importance of presenting options to designers and letting the designers learn from the options that are presented. It's not just a, uh, and, and ideally, it's not just a, a random enumeration of possibilities, but uh, you really wanna identify and lock in on these relationships between different system design choices and the characteristics of the built system. So that's sort of abstract. So let's return to that example that you mentioned earlier about you know buying something on, on Amazon or, or just buying like a, a new shirt, for example. It's not very helpful if you want to buy a new shirt to get a list of every shirt that is available for sale on earth, even if this would somehow be possible. Instead, you probably go into your search with some characteristics in mind, right? You want a shirt in a particular size, maybe a, a certain color, you probably have a maximum price that you're willing to spend things like that. And so you might start looking at shirts in a store or online. Uh, but as you very as you do this search very quickly, you're gonna learn that there are some relationships between these. So maybe all the shirts from a particular brand are very expensive, or all of the shirts uh, made out of some fabric are too warm or too cool for the time and, and place that you wanna get the shirt for. So what, what you're learning here is the relationship between the price and the brand or the fabric and you know, when uh, the shirt is wearable. And so as more choices become enumerated, these relationships are what uh, you're really learning. Like you, you, you see the individual shirts, you understand that they are individually available for sale, but what you're really learning is sort of the relationships between the inputs and the outputs. And this is the essence of the, the design by shopping approach that Gatsy aims to bring to the, the world of critical system design or critical system evaluation by certification authorities like you're talking about. That a system designer can specify characteristics that they care about. Um, these are automated analyses that run in the Osate workbench. So things like weight calculations or power consumption or price or, or what have you. Then given this library of candidate components, restrictions on how they interact in case there's software incompatibilities or maybe an overall power cost or weight budget, uh, the technologies that we've talked about, ATSV and OSATE, moderated by this project, GATSI, will work together to come up with candidate architectures. And then system designers can look at these candidates and discover relationships that may not have been initially obvious, that were not knowable a priori. Uh, and of course, uh, they can then refine their search and eventually maybe see some candidates that are particularly promising. And then these can be modeled and explored uh, further uh, using more traditional system development methodologies. So one of the things I'm getting from this is, which I really like, 
is that we're not asking the computer to do the job. We're asking the computer to automate so that we can make better decisions by getting better information that is tuned to the problem. And I know in the systems I work in, this is particularly important because of what you said. There are there are relationships that are not at all obvious when you start getting these complex systems of systems. And algorithmically, I would not expect to be able to get to an optimal solution. Any optimal solution is probably going to engender some cascading set of effects that I never, you know, intended. So this idea that it's, I love that idea that it's giving me this candidate set to choose from. And I'm wondering, are, are, is part of, and we haven't talked about this before, but um, are there, is there a thought of sort of a building a community who contributes um, analyses of different kinds of safety related components, you know, that people can sort of say what, look at in terms of not just building their own configurations, but hey, here's what, you know, this jet manufacturer uh, put together for wheel brake systems. And, you know, as of 2022, you know, here were the choices that they had and here are some of the, the things they learned from doing these. Is that is that part of the vision for this or is that sort of, am I too far down the road? So I, I don't I don't want to say that's not part of the vision. That is farther down the road than than where we looked in this project. But but the you're right that sort of once you once you have these characteristics that you care about, once you have ways of calculating them, there are a number of really really interesting and cool options uh, for where this could go. Um, exploring libraries of components uh, is one of those. Um, putting you know, some of the characteristics that you care about in things like acquisition documents um, is another uh, potential application of this, that that we can we can start to maybe lift some of what we call, what, what the sort of uh, fancy sounding term desiderata, some of the desired characteristics of the system that we want. If we can, if we can formalize those, if we can lift those out of natural language, whether that is, yeah, in, in requirements documents, in acquisition specifications, things like that, and, and move them into things like AADL uh, or the configuration language that we extended it with in this project, that's really a similar arc to the story that we tell with AADL more, more generally, that if you are able to move a requirement out of a natural language document and put it into a model of a system, that that has all sorts of benefits because there's reduced ambiguity, there's, there's in, enhanced specificity, things like that. So I think I think what you're what you're uh, identifying there is is really an application of the the Gatsy approach or the the design by shopping approach to things that are not modelable in AADL, uh, and that's uh, that's part of the work of the model based engineering team uh, here at the SEI more generally is yeah formalizing aspects of the system acquisition and development process. Have you talked about any of the safety certification community about how they might use this? Because I can see where there could be, um, you know, certain certification standards that you know have to be applied all the time. I'll go back to the wheel brakes. Um, you know, everybody knows what those are, and if the certifiers can actually do a little more formalization of what the real boundaries are. Right. Of those characteristics where in natural language it may not be as clear, then I can see us getting, you know, better designed because I have a better idea of what that what those boundaries are. But have you had interest from them in looking at this? So we have we have extended so there are actually two versions of the paper that came out. And it's good that you mentioned safety because this is one of the key differences between them. One of the one of the things that we were able to fit into the journal paper. Um, that we did not in the initial, the earlier conference paper was an application of Gatsy to the safety domain. Uh, one of the things that's tricky about safety though is that uh, Gatsy requires uh, quantifiable analyses, right? Because it, it's running these analyses in an automated fashion. It's getting back either uh, a string or, um, or a number, whether it's integer or floating point. And then it is, you know, if it is a number, it is displaying it graphically in, in one of the many charts that are available through the ATSV uh, software. Safety is a little bit res resistant to um, quantification. So there are some traditional safety analyses coming uh, out of the you know 50s and 60s, things like uh, fault tree analysis or failure modes and effects analysis. And these are these are well studied and well understood, but there is sort of the increasing recognition um, in some places that they are less applicable to 
systems with large software elements. And I say that because software does not fail in the same way as the more hardware-based systems that, uh, that these uh, traditional safety analyses were designed to use. So in the journal paper, we have some really, uh, we use an example of a cool uh, sort of Bayesian-based uh, safety analysis uh, that has an interesting side effect of being um, much more computationally intensive than most analyses. And so we, we talk about using GATSI in sort of a, a two-stage process where you run a lot of cheap analyses early, you identify better candidates, and you focus in on those candidates and, and run more expensive analyses. That more expensive analysis is the safety analysis. So we haven't uh, had a ton of engagement with the safety community, but it, just because of certainly the background of the group and, and my own research interests, it is something that we're interested in and that, and that we've looked at uh, a little bit in, in the journal version of the publication on GADSI. And the thing I know about that community is, you know, they just become more and more overwhelmed because as more and more software is the critical functionality, they can't mm -hmm. rely on some of the simpler hardware-based safety uh, kinds of, of ways of looking at the world, FMEA, et cetera. And, and, and there's just more and more and more. So helping them to automate their certification processes, I think would be something that, that, uh, that would make a lot of people sleep better at night. Yeah. So I do want to actually let people go through an example. So let's, can you take us through an example application of, mm -hmm. of um, uh, uh, Gatsy and, and, and just sort of generally how it would work? Yeah. Let me get back to this, the, the wheel braking system uh, as our, well, standard example that um, we talk about a lot. Um, so again, in the system, we have some mechanical components. There's a wheel and uh, brake assembly, um, the pilot's brake pedals, for example. Then uh, there's some hydraulic system involved. There are a couple of redundant pumps and various control valves and some pressure vessel and uh, whatnot. And um, then finally, we have some computer system that controls uh, the whole thing. So there's, there's the BSCU, uh, brake system control unit. Um, where, for example, we can have, could have two federated CPUs running monitor software, um, and um, we also need a CPU power supply for that. So now let's uh, keep this simple, because otherwise um, uh, I'll lose track while talking about it and nobody um, can understand what I'm talking about. So uh, for simplicity, let's assume we have all components selected, and uh, except just some BSCU components and the power supply for the for the computer. Um, the next, uh, so let's assume then we have all this and we create an ADL model, put all this uh, this information in that we um, have so far. Um, but we use uh, placeholders um, in the model for the um, CPU and the monitor software and the power supply. So these placeholder components. Uh, have just enough features to describe the external interfaces uh, so that we can say, okay, how, how are they connected? For example, we have just some placeholder for the power supply that has some kind of connect, some wire to the CPU or to the board where the CPU sits on and, and, and things like that. But we don't uh, say what exactly these things are. Um, and also, we don't know what the what the exact properties are, such that the such as the weight or the cost, because that's that depends on which um, um, actual component we then select in the end. Um, so in ADL, we have a, we have a way to do this with, that's called component types that just describes the outside of a component, but not the inside. Um, in the next step, then, um, we define which specific components we have available to replace or to insert for the, in, into the holes for the component types. Um, in ADL, these things are called component implementations, with and, and we add specific properties to them. Um, so we would, um, for example, say, well, which, which CPUs do we have? Maybe the, the, we have ARM, Intel processors, and MIPS CPUs. We have various power supplies. Um, that we could use. We have um, software pieces that we could from older pro previous projects that we could reuse. Um, so we um, create modeling, uh, of course, ADL um, model com elements for all these uh, things, so that we can we can then insert them into the into the into the overall model. Um, 
So again, of course, uh, not all the, uh, the, the implementations are a good fit. So um, based on what we know, which components we have, we, we can already pre-specify some choices. For example, if we know that an Intel CPU doesn't work here, well, we will not try this. We won't even try it out. But all the, 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 at least the, the known, the known not to be impossible choices, we put we put them in in the conf, in, in this configuration file, uh, in the configuration language, and um, then um, um, specify these as lists of candidate components that that can be fi uh, filled in. Um, in addition to that, we also need to write down any constraints that we have. That's also part of the configuration language. So. Um, for example, the one requirement might be that the well we cannot mix two different kinds of CPU. We want the same. We want two of the same. We just want to have them uh, have two of them to have redundant execution to um, to to increase the reliability of our um, control unit. Um, then also, well, we have requirements on the power supply, so it must match the power consumption of the CPUs, obviously. So all this. Um, um, we write that down into into those into the configuration file, and also which analysis we want to run. Um, we talked about that. Um, so, for example, we will run the weight analysis. We want to um, run a power analysis. We want to um, maybe also run some schedulability analysis to see that um, uh, this this system uh, reacts fast enough and samples fast enough and and things like that. And um, we also, as the final uh, component in the configuration, we, we write down um, what optimization criteria, if any, we want to have. For example, that the cost should be minimum, minimized and also constra maybe constraints on the cost that we have and, and uh, uh, things like that. So based on all this, we, we then um, use um, ATSV to start the process. So that, the, and as, as um, Sam described, the ATSV then generates architectures based on the choices that we have in the configuration, or, or it selects choices. Wasat instantiates this as an architecture, analyzes, reports back the results to ATSV, and it uh, runs then through a bunch of combinations. And um, yeah, then. The main thing is to visually inspect the, the, the output first to see what what uh, what results we get. Of course, this is sometimes uh, it, that, that's a bit tricky because you have if you have multiple dimensions, you can only put so many in one diagram. Uh, you cannot put twenty different dimensions in a diagram. Uh, three or four is, is is about the maximum that you that you can get. So that requires then some some smarts of the user to to figure out okay what. To evaluate what what this re these results actually mean, and based on that, then select maybe uh, one of the the, com the choices that um, is is uh, was was presented by ATSV, or add new components, or add more information into the, into the model to to refine the the result of the analysis, or maybe take some choices away away and add more analysis and things like that. So I'm I'm I'm. I'm thinking about the aspect of we come up with no viable choices. That's really important information. You know, if when we're early in, in the systems engineering to be able to say what we've designed is not feasible and we've got to go, you know, reassess other elements besides just this component. I, I find that to be very powerful. And it's the kind of thing when you tell somebody that a design is infeasible and they want to say, well, where's your proof? You know, I don't know if I call this proof, but it's certainly a strong evidence that I'm telling you the right thing. Because if I try and run these kinds of analyses up against multiple configurations, I get no answer that is viable. So that that alone, I think some of the systems engineers in our audience are going to be going, oh, I want this. So let's talk about people that want Gatsy. <laughs> Um, to be fair, I know that AADL has a bit of a steep learning curve, and um, so there's some investment in learning, but what, what other kinds of challenges can users expect in using this tool so they go in with their eyes open, and how can they mitigate some of those? Yeah, I mean, of course, the, the first thing is this was a research project, 
And um, yes. so it's not we, a commercial tool, right? Right. It's, it's, it's def <laughs> definitely not a commercial quality tool. Um, and um, I think it was, uh, was there anybody else involved? So it was just a, well, yeah, it was essentially a two-person effort. Um, so it um, is the tool itself is more of a prototype, proof of concept and not um, as mature as, as you would like in the end. But it is at least in a stage where potential users could give it a try with our help, of course, uh, probably. And um, um, But to, to make this, um, I mean, really use, usable to non-experts, there, there would be some definitely more work required to, to make this into, into something um, sure. uh, viable. And, and is because this is an externally it starts from an external tool, the ATSV. Are there other modeling languages like SysML that are commonly used that you would be able to uh, use with this yet? Or is that something that would be in the future? Um, where would that fit? Because I know yeah, a lot of is... my engineering friends are SysML people. Yes, yeah, we, we've, we've thought about that a bit. Um, because, yeah, you mentioned already that ADL is, has, has, a, has a learning curve. Um, and um, a lot of potential users will be familiar with SysML already. Uh, there are there's there's one uh, one thing that um, makes that a bit tricky to use SysML instead of ADL for for this, and that is that in SysML you have much more freedom to develop um, your models. So in ADL is much more strict and much more formal, and has much more constraints which gives it the advantage that it's easier to write an analysis that is applicable to any ADL model that you throw at it. With gotcha. um, SysML, um, it's often that, yeah, you probably in, inside in a given organization, you probably have some standards that you use for your SysML models, additional constraints that are not given, that are not part of SysML, but that's part of how you build your models right, in your right, organization. Right. And, um, so then you would that's the, the then the analysis would of course be uh, um, yeah they would of course need to be specific to this specific style right. of using SysML. So that's make this makes this a bit more challenging to just um, move to to a different language. But um, yeah, that would of, of course um, broaden the appeal a lot to to be able to support uh, SysML. Possible future research project. So, and Susan right. is also also moving into a more form, a bit more formal yes, yes. with the next version. So. I would say I'm observing that that people I they call them design rules or business rules. You know where that idea of SysML, but you must use these kinds of parameters for this kind of a function, and where you actually add some of that formalism into the SysML from your local users is is a practice that I'm seeing more. Uh, in the engineering community than I than I did in the past, so so there might be something there in the future. Uh, so we've been I've I've kind of been leading you into some transition topics um, in terms of future uses and um, you know different areas of of, uh, of possible extension. Um, so what is the transition strategy for this? Are you looking for partners to evolve the tools? Are you looking more for users to try it and, and give you feedback on it. Um, and if they want to try it, how do they access it? Um, you know, what other resources are available to them in terms of documentation and guidance? Uh, absolutely. There's, we're actually, we're looking for, for all three of those things for, for, you know, individual users, for, for organizations to try it out. Uh, and then if they want to partner with us to sort of evolve it in a direction that's more amenable to their, uh, their approach, that's something that we're super open to. And we've had some queries from researchers that are doing other um, research type things with, you know, design space exploration that are interested in specific elements uh, of the work as well. So we're working with them and, and would love to hear from more if you're doing research and some, you know, particular aspect of GATS interests you, you don't want to use the whole uh, tool chain, we get it, um, please, please reach out. So I'll say sort of as a starting point, you can download and install the tool now. There are full setup instructions on the project's GitHub page, um, which is just github.com slash osate, O-S-A-T-E, slash osate2 dash gtse. I'm sure this is all going to be, uh, be in linked the <laughs> in, the, in the transcript too. Um, in short, though, you, you download ATSV from the ATSV website, osate from the osate website, and then install Gatsy through osate and you're good to go. 
I will add uh, my own sort of caveat, just like Luke said, you know, the SEI produces technology at a range of maturity levels. Most of it uh, is, is ready to use. Some of it is a little bit more experimental. Gatsy is, of course, downloadable and usable, but it is a little bit more experimental. Um, it will definitely work best if you're familiar with ADL and Osate already. Uh, if this is the first you're hearing about those, I would encourage you to check out the training and educational resources that we have. Um, uh, Peter Feiler, uh, who Lutz mentioned earlier, and Dave Glutch, another uh, researcher from the team, put out a textbook that I use to teach myself AADL and OSATE. It's great. Um, we have an e-learning course uh, for um, more sort of rapid hands-on uh, learning. And then, of course, all sorts of tech reports and user guides that'll show you the ropes. Uh, as far as documentation for Gatsy, the best resource is going to be the, the journal paper that I mentioned earlier in, the, in software and systems modeling. We have user-oriented documentation on the GitHub page. Um, the journal article does a better job of explaining the how and why. So if you know exactly what you want to do, uh, the GitHub documentation will help you. Um, but since this is sort of a new uh, area, the journal uh, explanation of, of why certain things are the way they are will probably be useful. You're also welcome to post any issues you have to the, the GitHub repository, email Lutz or I with questions about the, the software, the technology, or pose your questions on the Osate mailing list, which is linked on uh, osate.org, the, the main website. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just w one last time, really welcome all sort of uh, transition opportunities. So if you're, if you're curious about this, please reach out. Uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to talk. Well, I want to thank you both for talking about this today. This podcast had to be rescheduled a couple of times. And so when I first read the blog post, I'm like, ah, I'm so excited. And I'm glad that I finally got to talk to both of you about it, because I think this is, is the direction that model-based engineering can take. You're demonstrating where it can go, to where it's not quite so human intensive for every little piece of it. And that just adds power to the learning that, that people get from models. So I just, I love that. Um, we, as, as we've said multiple times, we are going to include links to all the things we've talked about in the transcripts. Um, and I want to finally remind our audience that our podcasts are available pretty much everywhere you find your podcast. My favorite is, of course, the SDI YouTube channel. Um, and if you like what you hear and see today, you're always welcome to give us a thumbs up. Um, no pressure. But I, I do want to thank all of our audience for joining us today. I hope that uh, some of you take the plunge and uh, get involved with, with Gatsy and AADL because I think it's, it's really going in a direction that's going to be helpful, especially to the safety and sort of the quality attributes that, that sort of get left behind a lot of times in our software architecting. So thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.